Okay, so let's go ahead and go ahead and fire up AutoCAD if you would. And uh, we're going to, uh, if you want to step through this with me or just watch, depending on what you want to do. And um, we're going to look at uh, the hatch command first. Um, and hatch is not um, used uh, extensively or all, uh, for a lot of purposes, but it is nice to delineate areas kind of things. Um, proper name for it was what we would call a cross hatch. Um, they call it a hatch and they have two what are called types of hatches. One is called a, a, just a normal hatch and they have what's called a gradient fill. Now, basically, they're the same command. If we look over here under the draw section, you'll notice down here, this is your two commands right here, what they call hatch and gradient. They're essentially the same command, as we'll see. And then this other cool little tool, this guy's called boundary, and this is a really nice little thing. Uh, creates a polyline for you, and it's really nice for um, generating uh, polylines that you want to get areas in. Um, prior to Civil 3D, what they have were called parcels, kind of a similar process. Um, this was a tool I used to use extensively, so I'm going to show you that a little bit. So if you would, um, while we're doing this hatch, um, go ahead and uh, draw this little figure for me. It doesn't have to look exactly like this, just a simple rectangle, a circle with another rectangle inside of it, and then another circle, and then you can just put a piece of text anywhere like that. And after you get that done, go ahead and um, under your layers, just create a new layer for me. Um, give it a different color, something that you can see very vibrantly on the screen. And go ahead and set that current. Because, uh, with hatches, just like any other kind of complex object that you're dealing with, hatches um, will, um, you, wanna, you wanna manage them on layers. And uh, particularly because um, they can be pretty involved objects. So, okay, take a sec to do that. What I also, also want you to do, uh, let's do this, I forgot to do this. Go ahead and um, go back to your zero layer, if you will, and just draw three lines. And I want you to draw those lines such that they're open like this. So we have a boundary here, but they're not a closed boundary. So notice mine are not open like that. So uh, while you guys are drawing that, let me just explain. A hatch is a pattern of lines or objects that fill in an area, and they usually convey information. Um, so the classic is what's called a, a cross hatch, where you have lines going in two different directions but they have all kinds of different hatch patterns as we'll see that are out there um, that represent maybe different areas or different things. So they're ways of filling something in. Uh, they have a boundary associated with them and establishing the boundary tends to be probably the biggest part of a hatch. So that's not, that's not a big deal, but they are kind of strange in the way they work. So you have to be real careful uh, with them. There's um. Two primary ways of selecting the boundary. One is to just select the lines, like if I just select that line, that line, and that line, that'll give me a boundary. Or I can just come inside and select a point like that, and it'll do what's called an internal point. So um, there's those two different methodologies, and they do generate a little bit differently in how they work. Um, so the way I hatch, let me, let me come over here a minute and show you how a hatch works. So a hatch, if you've selected typical boundaries, say I've got an object here and another object here. If you have selected both of those guys as hatch boundaries, you can kind of think of the way, if this is selected and this is selected, with what they call normal hatch um, uh, mode, um, when it hits the first boundary, it turns the hatch on, and then it hits the second, it's off. Turns it on, turns it off, turns it on, turns it off, turns it on, turns it off. So it's kind of, you can see what's happening. And so as each structure goes more internal, um, you're gonna get more of that going on. So this is a typical type of hatch. 
So both of these things would be boundaries and it's recognizing both of them. So you can make it um, only recognize the most inner one, uh, but it, you could also have it if I have a circle in here, let's say, or another rectangle. If I'd selected all of those when I'd done this initially, it would have recognized that as part of the hatch as well, goes through it. So there's a, this is what's called a normal mode of hatching. Then they have what's called outermost where it would ignore that. And they have an ignore mode, which will go right through everything. Anything internal, it ignores completely. So it just depends. So your, your normal way of operating with this would be a, uh, what they call a normal style because that recognizes your internal structures. So as we do this, um, when you do a hatch, it's real simple. Uh, let's go over here. And again, there's the two types of hatches. We're gonna just choose this guy called hatch here. So what you get is a context sensitive editing tab right here. And this is all your hatch commands. They're pretty, pretty basic. Uh, this is what you select your boundaries with. So the, the name of this command is B hatch for boundary hatch. So what it does is it finds its own boundary. And using this guy, it generates basically a polyline when you just pick inside of it. Um, if you wanna select objects separately, like these objects here, you select them that way. And then we have the patterns. And notice we have quite a few patterns here. They have a solid and an angle. You can scroll down this list here or drop that down. Notice AutoCAD has quite a few in there. In fact, uh, if you scroll this, you can see you've got brass, brick, you know, all different ones. When you get down here, these guys right here are what you call your gradient fills. I, I call them like spray paint. That's kind of what they look like to me. And then you have the other ones. If they have an AR, that stands for architectural. Um, and then you have other ones down here. And you can also create your own hatch patterns. Uh, so they basically are just like a block. You would create a block and then you would make it part of the hatch pattern. Um, and then you can create what's called a user. So you basically have a solid hatch, which I think is at the very top. And yeah, there's a solid hatch. Which is, which is newer to AutoCAD, actually. I didn't have that always. Then you have these types of hatches, which are just basically lines or some other kind of complex object, gradient fills, and then you have what are called users. Uh, you can also grab that same thing here by clicking this. So you can go to solid, or you can go to gradient fill, or you can go to pattern, or you can go to user to find. So we'll take a look at those. So if you're using, uh, let's say, a typical, let's say, uh, pattern, when you use that, then you're going to have two, two things you can typically do to it. You can change the angle of that, and you can change the size spacing of it. So that's like a scale factor. So for instance, if you're doing brick or shingles, depending on what the scale factor you're drawing is, you need to, to increase or decrease that scale factor typically. If you use... Um, Basically, the solid hatch, it ignores both of those. And if you use what's called a user define, <clears throat> which we'll take a look at here, user define, when you go to a user defined option, this distance represents a actual value of distance between lines instead of a scale factor. Okay. Um, you can have an origin setting. So that determines like where your hatch starts. So if this is my origin setting down here and I'm doing brickwork, it'll create the brick starting right there. Otherwise, it'll use zero, zero as the, that. You may have a brick coming like right in the middle. So that's an important thing. Um, hatches are also what we call associative. So what that means is they recognize their boundaries. So as the boundary objects move, the hatch will move with it. So that's a really cool process as well. So what we're gonna do, uh, make sure, I mean, I'm gonna go ahead and escape out of here. Just make sure you guys are set. All right, so um, go back to your layers, and if you have the zero layer set, set your other layer up as your current layer, because your hatch is going to drop in on that layer typically, okay? So let's take a look. We're going to look at this guy first. We're going to come over here, and remember, notice how we drew that. Those guys aren't an enclosed boundary, okay? So we're going to go and do a hatch here. What I want you to do is let's pick a Let's pick a hatch pattern. Uh, let's find a, let me see. I'm gonna go through a pattern here. Open that guy up. Let's just find one. 
Now we'll call this net three. I'm just going to use that guy. So that's the hatch pattern it's going to use. I'm going to select objects. I'm going to select this object and then that object and then that object. So you'll notice when you get done, go ahead and hit. This did a really weird whacked out thing and it's because two reasons. Number one, the scale factor on this is really dense. So if you notice when I zoom up, their pattern actually is there, but it's hard to see. But also the way the boundaries are working, if you think about what I was talking about here, when it was doing this, remember it's an on off kind of thing. So as we look at this, if I got a line here and a line here and a line here, what's happening is when it hits the first line, it turns it on, turns it off, turns it on, turns it off. So what's going on is it's, it's just, it's whacking it out the way it's doing it. So you get some weirdness going on with this. So this is typically not the best way of doing it. Um, so the better method is what we call internal points. So you can just click on your hatch and then just delete it. So I'm going to show you a different method. So if we go to hatch and we do this guy called pick, points, you just pick a point internal and what it does is it basically finds that and notice that you can see the hatch boundary that it used. So it created that based on that. So now if yours is so dense like mine is, what we need to do is go up here to the scale factor and we need to make it bigger. So I'm going to make it five. You can see I can start to see now it's five times as big. So it's, I'm starting to get more definition. Maybe I want to make that uh, 10. Okay. You can see that makes a difference. Angle, of course, would be the angle with respect to X. So if I rotate that 30 degrees, notice how that rotates that. And so basically, uh, all of that is setting that up. Now notice again down here on my origin, my origin, if I want that to kind of be the origin, I can set an origin based on like a lower left corner of that. I'm using an O-snap. It should change that. So origins can be, sometimes people don't worry about those too much. Okay, is everybody hopefully getting those to generate? Anybody problems on that? So picking the point is definitely the thing that you want to do with a hatch, okay? When you get done with this, you're going to hit this button here, uh, close, it'll create the hatch for you. And notice that that tab disappears. You're going to see a lot of that going on in Civil 3D, by the way. Um, those context sensitive editing tabs are going to be there a lot. So this hatch now, if you notice, if you click on it, he's all one object. And um, let's see, let me, let me kill some of my stuff that keeps popping up here. Um, so when you select it, you're actually in what's called the hatch editor. So it basically looks exactly like the same command. And it essentially is, is, but it allows you to go in and change things. So if you want to add more objects and remove them, you can do that. You can change from one format to another. So if I don't want uh, that hatch pattern, let's say I want that hatch pattern, I can just click on it, change it. Change my scale factors, my angle, any of that stuff is very easy to edit. Hatches are real easy to edit. So when you get that, you got that. Um, so the thing that's not so cool about a hatch is if you explode it, you've destroyed the hatch. So it's like with a, with a dimension object, we said you never want to explode that. With a hatch pattern, if you explode it, first of all, you've killed the hatch and it literally can create thousands of objects instantaneously. So you would have that issue too if you exploded a hatch. So um, definitely never do that. But just to show you, if I take this, say explode here, select my hatch and hit enter, that hatch is just a bunch of lines now. And that would be, that would be real detrimental. So again, you can imagine, like I said, you can get thousands of, of objects very quickly. All right, so let's, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and delete these because we really don't wanna see that one. This is an example though, of where B hatch is really cool. So this can find all these internal structures and. Notice the reason I did it this way is so that it can find internal structuring as it goes and also put a piece of text there because it recognizes text as well as an object. Um, so what we're gonna do is go to hatch here and we're gonna go to options first. And I want you to make sure that it's set to what's called normal detection because notice there's um, normal 
which is kind of an in-out, in-out kind of island detection. Then you have outermost, which would only look at the outer ones. And then you have ignore. So make sure that you're set to normal. And we're going to come over here and we're going to grab a pattern. Um, this is one of my favorites. I'm going to grab one. It's called Escher. Based on MC Escher stuff, if you notice him. Now we're going to do a, a select internal point. Now you have to kind of be be particular where you hit pick it because sometimes if I like pick it over here, it won't see all of the internal structure. So I'm just going to pick it here and notice it found that. My scale factor is a bit high. I'm going to take that down to one. That's a bit low, maybe two. And you notice uh, there's your pattern. Maybe change my angle back to zero. And then we're going to head okay. And so there's your hatch. And so notice it's recognized on off on off all the internal structures. So this is where it actually gets really cool. Since this is an associative hatch and this is my boundary, if you click on your polyline and drag your polyline out, notice your hatch will go right with it. Also, watch this boundary. It'll actually even it'll actually even move with it because it knows how that internal structure worked. So uh, B hatch is great, and the fact that uh, this all works that way is really cool. So again, if I move that back in, it recognizes it. Now, what you don't want to typically do with any boundary is kill it. So if I delete that boundary, um, it can give you problems. So you can have issues with that. But uh, that's really kind of it in a nutshell in terms of those um, types of hatches. Uh, those hatches work great. Is anybody having any questions with them? Problems? Pretty easy to execute. All right, I'm going to do a couple of undos back. I want to get my pattern back to what it was initially. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and delete this hatch. And we're going to take a look at another hatch, which is useful, which is called a user hatch. So a user hatch is just a uh, bunch of lines. Essentially, they're just parallel lines. And um, the distance, the, the spacing is actually the distance between the lines. So if you put in like quarter, it'll be a quarter inch spacing. If you toggle on what's called double cross hatching, then you're going to get lines that are going to run 90 degrees with respect to the other lines. So if we go into hatch, what we're going to do first is set up the pattern here to what we call a user defined. So this is just going to give me, um, this is going to give me parallel lines. Uh, this number two here, if it's set up to two, that's the distance between the lines. So it's not a scale factor, it's an actual distance. So if I put in, uh, let's say 0.25, now it's gonna be a quarter inch. I think if I open this up, down here there's what they call double cross hatch. If you select that, actually, double cross hatch is gonna give me two. Okay, so I got user defined quarter. I'm gonna go ahead and pick my internal point again, click it here, and notice there's your double cross hatch. Um, if you don't want it double, I think you can turn it off. There's there's a single cross hatch. Notice my spacing in my case is a little big, so I'm going to set that up to 0.5, and uh, then maybe set that to 30 degrees. So this is just a really simple, quick user-defined hatch. And again, it's just parallel lines based on a spacing, based on an angle. So there's not a whole lot that you would do with those, uh, but I actually use that probably as much as some of the patterns. Um, so they've got Great, great patterns. Um, so once I get this, got it, there it is. So it's also easy to just switch a hatch from one to the other. So if you have this hatch on there, you wanna change it, you just come up here and say, I really want that to be concrete. So I can find my AR concrete. Oh, come on, where is it? Right there, there's my concrete type. So hatching is really easy. You can also click on a hatch, right click, and go to properties and all of your hatch properties are in here as well. So if you would rather use this than this box up here, you can do that. Another type of box you can get is if you click this guy right here, this is the old dialogue boxes that you used to see. This was, um, this was pre, I don't know, release maybe 
12 or something. Um, this is what it looked like when you had the hatch patterns. They didn't have these context sensitive editing tabs. So you had everything here is up here. So it's all, it's all pretty similar. Um, so you can do it that way if you'd like. And uh, let's see, go ahead and we'll set that. Another, another method you can use is, is deriving the hatch pattern at the command line. So if you put a hyphen in front of the word hatch, you just type in hyphen hatch and hit enter. Instead of using a context sensitive editing tab or a dialog box, what it's doing for you is allowing you to do it through the command line. So everything you have here is up in the, up on those sections. There's one that's not there and that's uh, allows you to do what's called draw a boundary. So this is kind of a cool little routine. It allows you to create a boundary on the fly. So you don't have to have objects to select. You can create your own. So for instance, if I go here, draw a boundary and I'm going to toggle on my who snaps. So I can draw a boundary. Um, yes, I'm going to retain a polyline. I'm going to start it here run it here and come out here, 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 and then close it. And then what it does is that creates that polyline line for me. So you can't do that in the dialog boxes or you can't do that when you do it context sensitive. That's, that's the only difference with that. So that's a cool little tool. But other than that, you probably would never want to use that as much. That's the only thing I would use it for. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and delete this. And we're going to change this up. So go ahead and delete that. I'm going to show you a gradient fill. So gradient fills, like I said, I kind of think they look like spray paint. Um, if you go here to gradient, what it allows you to do is choose different types of gradients. The way it fills it, what they call linear or cylindrical or an inverted cylinder, you can have two different color schemes or a single color scheme if you only want that. Um, again, just pick your internal point and basically it just goes. But I can then change my colors up. I don't want that color. I can do that really easily. So all this is real easy to change and edit. When you get done, you just close it. Um, the way it prints on your printer, it's probably gonna be depending on whether you have a color printer or not. And also I think if it doesn't, it grayscales it which would take a lot of ink sometimes. So be careful if you're going to use gradient fills um, because they are going to generate a lot more, a lot more information. So those are your hatch, hatch options. Um, very, very easy to use. We're going to, we're going to utilize them just a little bit as we get into some of this stuff. So um, any questions anybody has? Okay. Um, all of these commands, uh, keep in mind as we get into civil today, they're all going to be available to you um, in civil 3D because you are working in AutoCAD. That's kind of the cool thing. So you kind of know, you already know a third about how the program works once we get into it, but the two thirds of it that are going to be involved are going to be a lot more involved. So, all right, so let's uh, take a look at grips a little bit. Uh, we can just go ahead and you can just go ahead and discard this if you'd like. And I want you to draw a couple different objects for me. Uh, I'm going to go back to the zero layer, by the way, so you can see things a little bit cleaner. Okay. Now, if anybody does have a, a question, just stop me. Okay. So let's go ahead, just draw a line, maybe a rectangle, um, circle. And go ahead and you can put a little piece of uh, dimension real quick. Just pick two points and grab it. Don't worry about what it looks like, just so you see the objects. So grips are editing tools. And uh, we've seen them in AutoCAD. And um, I'm in dimensioning, I'm, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and you're going to see them also in Civil. Now they're, they're going to be a little bit different in Civil 3D. Um, so understanding how they work in AutoCAD is good because you're going to see more types of grips because you're going to have completely different object sets as we get into Civil 3D. But we know that if we click any object, you get these little blue boxes. And depending on the type of object you're getting that, is anybody not getting those blue boxes? 
Is everybody getting those blue boxes? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a yes. So if you want to deselect your object, you'll deselect your grip. So just hit the escape key and it'll deselect it. So let's take a look at uh, the grip states in terms of what you can make visible or not. So if you take your cursor anywhere into the graphics area, right click, and we're gonna to go to options. We're gonna to navigate to the selection tab. And right here where you have show grips, um, if that's toggled off, okay, I'm gonna turn it off, apply it. I won't get grips. So my grip editing tools are completely um, unusable for me right now. That's something that you do really don't want to do in Civil 3D because you're going to want to use grips a lot. Okay, so if you're not using grips at all, sometimes they pop up all the time. You don't want them. You're not using them. That's a good thing to do. Okay, so make sure for one thing that your options is set to show grips. Now, if you have grips, if you have a block that has a lot of complex grips, I think I might have shown you. Maybe I did. Um, you can either show all of the grips within the block or you can just show the insertion point grip. So a lot of times this, this, is, this is good with blocks to turn off so you don't see all of your grips. Now let's go to grip colors here. So there's basically uh, three grip states, essentially. What they call an unselected grip and notice it's set to a blue color. And then they have what's called a secondary state which is called a hover grip and it changes to a kind of a salmonish color, you know, a pinkish color. And then you have what's called a selected grip. Um, they used to call these, back when they first introduced grips in AutoCAD, they called a, this grip a cold grip, this a warm grip, and this a hot grip. And I kind of liked that term better than unselected, hover, and selected. But when it's in this state, the unselected state, it's just there, but it's not active. If you hover that grip, what you'll do is you'll get a group of shortcut menus that you can use. So that's a pretty cool tool. And then this one makes them hot. This makes them active. Um, so they do go through those three states. Uh, never used this contour one, so I don't, don't have a, a real knowledge. The one thing I don't like the way they've done it, these colors are pretty similar on the screen. You're going to see they don't look a whole lot different. Uh, so sometimes, I mean, you might want to set that to a completely different color so that it just it, it jumps out at you. But I'm going to leave how, it how, how do you change the states from selected, unselected to hover to selected? Okay, I'm going to show you that here in a minute. Okay, okay. so that depends on how you pick them. Okay, um, and so we're going to get we're going to get there right now. Okay, good question. Okay, but I just wanted to show you as we pick these, you're going to see these different colors appear. Okay, so go ahead and if you want to change these colors up, that's fine. I, I would definitely leave the unselected blue and the hot grip or the selected red. But sometimes it's nice to have a hover grip of a different color. You'll see what I mean here in a minute. So if I hit OK here and I'm going to apply it, and if you made any changes, don't worry about it, uh, other than don't, don't mess it up. OK, so here's your question. So when you, <coughs> excuse me, when you select an object, and by the way, the grips that you get are going to be, be dependent on the object you select. All grips are going to have, be different based on their uh, based on their object type. So if I go to a line, I basically get three grips: an end grip, end point grip, and a midpoint grip. So here's your question: If you take your cursor near that, it sucks it in like a black hole, and then it becomes a hover grip at that state. Okay. And now I haven't selected anything; I just took it to, to it. So if I pull it out, it's it's unselected. Pull it in; it's in a hover state. In a hover state, if you right click, usually you will get uh, some types of uh, things that you can do with it. Now in here, there's not a lot. When we get to like dimensions, you're gonna see things. So a hover state's just kinda, it's warm, it's ready to go, but it's not doing anything. So when you make it hover and then you left click, now you've made it warm or you've actually made it active, okay? So again, if I, Select an object, it's an unselected state. If I get near it, it's a hover grip. If I left click, it's out active, okay? So when they're active is when they really do a lot for you. So if you notice, if you picked it like mine, you'll notice basically I'm in a move state. If you look down at the command line though, it says you're in a stretch mode. 
okay? And that's dependent on where I actually selected it because if I would have selected the endpoint, my object would be stretching. But right now, since it's a midpoint, it can't stretch. If you hit your space bar one time, now you're in a move mode. If you hit it one more time, you're in a rotate mode. One more time, you're in a scale mode. One more time, you're in a mirror mode. And one more time, you're back to stretch. So go stretch, move, rotate, scale, mirror. And you can also right click and do the same thing. Stretch, move, rotate, scale, mirror. You can also do things like change your base point or copy objects. So I could do a copy and I could do a copy move. Let's see, I did that wrong. If I do a copy, it's copying, see? So these are gonna be really pretty cool tools uh, depending on how you're gonna use them. And um, when you get into um, civil, uh, hover grips will have a lot of functionality because they're gonna have, when you right click, they're gonna give you more options. So if we notice when we come to a circle, we get basically an endpoint grip or a center point grip, and then these would be essentially quad grips like that. Um, notice if you go to a rectangle, you get uh, endpoint grips or vertex grips, but you also get this guy here. Um, and this one actually lets you stretch the whole thing. So that's a little bit different than just a midpoint grip. Let's see if I set that. Notice when I hover it also, it does have options there. I can stretch the vertex, add vertex, or remove vertex. So with the one, I don't have that many options. So again, the hover state, sometimes you get a bunch. You'll notice the circle doesn't give me any options when I hover it, but the polyline does. So if I right click, if I say add, add a vertex, I can add a vertex, add another vertex. So they're pretty cool. Uh, also dimensions, which is gonna be a, a dimension object is pretty similar to the type of objects you're gonna be dealing with in auto and uh, civil 3D. They're gonna be really, really complex. So if I click on this guy, notice I get def point grip, I get a, a that's a def point essentially at the arrowhead. Then I have a text grip. So notice all the, when I hover it, all the different options that are available because of the type of object this is. I can move the text with a dimension line. I can move the text only. I can move it with a leader. I can pull it out like that. I can come over here, hover that. It's not going to give me much, but here, things like I think I showed you flip arrow, flip arrow, flip arrow. So hover grips, you have to kind of experiment with them. All objects are different and all some hover grips will give you stuff and some won't, okay? Anytime you um, don't wanna have a grip on or you wanna deselect, just make sure that you hit the escape key, all right? Any questions on grips? They're gonna be, they're gonna be pretty important. Um, and grip editing, if you think about it, and I don't a lot, I don't use them as much as I should, there's a lot of tools you can use because again, you have move, stretch, uh, copy, um, mirror, and scale all at your fingertips. And just depending on how you use them. So you have to, you have to play with them a little bit to get used to them. And if you don't want to use them at all, you can turn them off. But again, that's not going to be something that you want to do typically in conjunction with civil 3d. Any questions? So that's a right click when you're in when you're in hover. Well, to get you don't shortcut. Yeah, you don't have to actually. Let me show you. Um, if you there, I'm in my dimension, right? So you notice I'm in a hover state. You see that? You see how the tips are popping out right now? The tool tips. Yep. So yep. I can just actually go down there and say click on that. Okay. Now I can do the same thing. If you right click, you're going to get the same options, but you even get more sometimes up here, actually. Okay. Do you see that? So you, yeah. be, be, between the two of them, you actually have a lot of different things going on there. And actually, for instance, uh, let's see if I right click, I don't even see some of those aren't in there. So you get more right, right there that pop out for you. Okay. Does that make sense now? Yes. Thank you. And you're going to see, again, you're going to be doing a lot of that right clicking in Civil 3D. Okay, so you got to get used to it. Um, just kind of remember when in doubt, right click, because that's going to be really a really potent little thing to, to, to recognize, particularly with Civil 3D, because it's going to, all of the object types 
they're very complex and they will definitely respond to grips. Okay. Any questions? Any other questions? My suggestion is 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 play with them because, um, I, like I said, I tend to use them less than I should. And part of it is because of the way I learned AutoCAD. When I learned AutoCAD, grips didn't exist. So when I did a move, I did a move command. I don't think about the fact that, oh, I could just grip it and move it, or I could, I could grip it and stretch it. I don't think about that all the time. Uh, so it's taken me a while. I, I'm, I'm using them more than I used to, um, but they are definitely efficiency types of things. They're things that you really need to, to think about, okay? So let's take a look at uh, another thing that's kind of important, and this guy's called draw order. So draw order defines like what object is sitting on what other type of object. So um, now the thing is that when you create objects, there's, if they're all on a same plane, they're all sitting in that same plane. But even so, you can have one object look like it's sitting on top of another. So for instance, let's, uh, let's set our, um, Let's set our layer up to layer one. So we make a green or whatever color you're using. And I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna do a donut. Now I'm gonna set the inside diameter of this donut to zero. And I'm gonna make the outside diameter. Uh, you can set it to one if you want. Just make sure when you, you're gonna come over here and I want you to snap it like on the top of something like that so that you're clearly on top of objects, okay? So just place a couple of donuts, make sure you're on top of objects. So you'll notice now, as you look at this, is that um, when I look at this, the lines are being covered up by that donut. Now the reality is, is they, they are sitting on the same plane, so it's not like that green donut is higher. It's not, okay? That's not what's going on there, but What's happening is there's a time sequence. These lines were created earlier than the donut was. So what's happening, these guys are, are showing up underneath that essentially. So if you print this, this is exactly the way it's going to print, which may be what you want. But you might wanna be able to see those lines through that object. So what you can do is swap the draw order, basically the time frame. So you can do it one of two ways. I can drop this to the background or I can bring this to the front. So if I click this guy and right click about midway down, you'll see draw order. And what I can do is I can send that to the back and notice you should be able to see your line work on top of that. And it'll, it'll actually print that way now. Um, so notice this draw order, that guy's sitting underneath. Okay. Now I could bring that guy to the front, bring it to the front. Okay, so that's are, those are some things to think about because a thing like this, that's actually covering up my tax. That might not be what I want. So if I can bring this guy to the front on top of that for whatever reason, then it shows up, okay? So that's a very simple thing. I'll, I'll want you to recognize this too about draw order is that I've had this happen is sometimes you'll set your draw orders up You'll save your drawing and you'll open it back up and they'll swap back to the way they were initially. So sometimes that happens. So be careful, particularly if you're doing things with printing. Any questions? So you uh, left click to select it and then right click to get to the draw order. Correct, correct. And what I'm doing is utilizing those concepts of shortcuts, um, which again, they're um, extremely important when we get into civil 3D because everything's, well, not everything, but your efficiency level goes way up if you start using shortcuts. Um, you'll find stuff five times quicker because uh, it's just like anything. AutoCAD has two or three ways of always doing things or finding things. Same thing works with Civil 3D, okay? We good? You guys getting it to work, draw order? It's an important little thing. Um, a lot of people don't think about that sometimes, but it can it can make a difference in your picture and what you're showing, particularly like something like that. It would be real easy to print that and all of a sudden realize, oh, that thing's covering that up. That's not a good thing. Okay, another little command I think I've talked a little bit about um, is purging. 
if you have a bunch of clutter in a drawing and you don't you don't want all that junk in there particularly things that aren't used you can get rid of it so but purge will get rid of are what are called named objects so a named object in AutoCAD is an object that you have given a name to and created more or less. So it's not an object. These are, these are drawing objects. So that's a drawing object. That's a drawing object. All of those guys are created primarily with your draws uh, tools. And um, they have names, but they're not the same thing. What we're talking about with a named object is a layer. So when you come up here, we created that and we called that layer one. Or we have a text style. Um, all of these guys, these are named objects. So there's a standard text style and there's an annotated text style. Those are named objects. Um, so uh, styles are named objects. Uh, layers are named objects. So anything that you would tend to give a name to, those are named objects. So these are things I can purge and or rename if I want to. So purging is cool because if you have a bunch of junk in a drawing that you're not utilizing, it's just cluttering things up. So what I can do is go into the purge command. The easiest way I find is to just type in purge and you'll get this dialog box that'll pop up for you. And first off, anything that is purgeable will show up here. So notice I have no blocks. I have no detail view styles. I have no groups. I have no purgeable layers. So anything that shows up in there uh, or doesn't show up as purgeable or not purgeable. So notice if I go to the dim style section, there's an annotated dim style that I can purge out. So if I want to get rid of that, I can just say purge all. Usually I just do a purge all, uh, purge this item, and it should take it out. Um, this is a good way of cleaning up a drawing, uh, particularly if you get something from somebody in industry. I'll tell you, you'll find um, people that work in industry, you know, you have all kinds of stuff out there and you might have, you might have 150 layers and you're only using two of them. So, you know, I don't like to look through a whole huge scroll through a layer list. So I'll just purge it out. In fact, I'll just take a drawing. Typically I get from somebody and just purge the whole drawing, get rid of everything that's not being used in it. Now it won't purge anything that's in use. Um, so, for instance, it couldn't purge layer one or def points or zero because those are in use and you can never purge the zero layer, by the way. Uh, it can't purge anything that's attached to this. So, like this dim style couldn't purge that dim style because that dim style is in use. So, that's the good news. It won't purge your drawing. Okay, that's, that's kind of cool. All right. Any questions on that? Okay, so one more I wanna show you before we jump into Sill here is called Quick Select. This is an awesome little tool and it allows you to select objects very rapidly in your drawing, uh, just basically by the object type. And then you can further filter that say by color or by line type or layer or whatever. So if you have like three donuts drawn like I do, or go ahead and draw some donuts that are on, the, on layer one. So I'm gonna draw a few more donuts I'm just going to pick a few more so that you can see your donuts. And then I want you to go in on another layer, create layer zero. We'll do a few more donuts just so that we see. Oops. So notice I got two types of donuts. One's on layer zero and one is on layer, uh, one is on layer one in my case. Or they also have different colors. Okay. So what's really nice about uh, quick select is that if you have those type of objects in your drawing and you wanna grab them all at the same time and do something with them, uh, trying to find them in a drawing for first off could be really difficult. If you have a really, really big, huge drawing, getting to all those objects and finding them could be really just detrimental. Um, so this gives you a quick way of selecting them. Now, uh, one caveat about this is that if you have objects that are locked or on layers that are locked or those layers are frozen, this will not find them. So you gotta be really, really careful with that too. Because uh, if you do have like point objects or something and you wanna move those all, 
uh, to a new coordinate reference system. You got to make sure that you get them all or you may leave some behind and that could be a problem. Okay, so quick select. Everybody got some donuts, different colors. So we're going to right click. We're going to go to options. I'm sorry, but not options. That was my bad. <laughs> okay, let's do that again. Just hit the escape key. We're going to right click. We're going to go to this guy called Quick Select. So it pops up this dialog box for me. Now, this is going to be interesting because notice you can apply this to your entire drawing. And it's got multiple objects right now. But I can, I can winnow that down by different object types. So notice I have right now, it recognizes lines, polylines, circles, and rotated dimensions. Why is not donut in that list? Does anybody know? Anybody know why donut is not popping up as an object in that list? Because it's a polyline? That's correct. So what happened now is that it's not recognizing that, okay? But I here, I'm going to show you. I can, I can winnow that out. I can say, okay, I'm going to select polylines. And then I can say, okay, I can do it by color. And here I'm going to say, well, the color equals uh, green. And then when you hit okay, it should have selected those. <laughs> All right, let me check something. Oh, I know why I didn't select it because that color isn't green on those. That color is um, that color is by layer. Let's try that again. <laughs> yeah, so you got to watch. You got to play with this a little bit. So I'm going to go again polyline, and I'm going to do it by layer, and I'm going to say that the layer equals layer one. Now it should have. Okay, notice it got those. So now then, what you can do is once you have those selected, then I can say, oh, okay, move these guys from here to here. So it's a really cool little tool once you use it. Um, and uh, I think, I don't think in AutoCAD, yeah, they have what's called quick select. When you get into, um, when you get into um, Civil 3D, they have what's called select similar. That's gonna be a, a companion tool. That'll be essentially do the same thing. Did everybody get that to work? Again, if I just select, quick select and I grab just polylines with, I don't have any other operator on it. I can just say equals whatever um, by layer. It should get all of them. Yeah, see, notice it gets every polyline. So it just depends on how you filter that out. And then you can add those to a selection set and you can do things with them, all right? So that's a, that's a convenient tool, but just remember um, it depends on how things are set and um, also, if things are locked or if they're frozen, they're going to be a problem for you. Okay. Any questions anybody has before we jump over to Civil 3D? We're good. All right. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and close AutoCAD. And we're going to go ahead and open up Civil 3D. So if you have Civil 3D handy, go ahead and launch it. And while that's launching, uh, let's talk a little bit about this. Um, if you have a chance to read the section in your book, uh, they give a nice little explanation about it. We're going to go through that. Um, the book's fairly well written. Um, I find a lot of kind of typos that I'm finding uh, just more it's a language issue, I think, the way they, they explain things. So I might explain them a little differently. Um, but uh, one thing is the terminology and everything's there. Now, you guys might start out in a screen that looks a little bit more like this. So uh, we'll, we'll take it from whatever level, though. So first of all, let me um, kind of explain. Right off the bat, he calls this, the author calls this a, a building information, BIM type software, building information. Well, it's truly modeling software in the sense that it's design modeling software. So the one thing to recognize is you're going to be in a CAD format, utilizing AutoCAD as a graphics engine, but you're going to have writing on top of this is a whole subset of design commands. And these design commands do work in truly a three-dimensional mode. Um, so that's the one thing to keep in mind. The other thing is you are in AutoCAD. So 
any AutoCAD functionality or commands that you're used to or any of that, it's all, it's all relevant, it's all available to you. But you have a whole group of other commands that Civil 3D brings to the table. Um, the objects that we'll create are gonna be completely different types of objects. So, I mean, you still have lines, arcs, circles, polylines, that kind of stuff, but you're gonna have other things like corridors or grading objects, uh, Civil 3D points, so these are gonna be a completely different subset of objects and AutoCAD won't recognize them uniquely. So if you open up uh, a civil 3D drawing in AutoCAD back a couple releases ago, if you did that, it wouldn't even be able to display those objects. Now it can display them, but it really can't do anything with them. So they're gonna lose any intelligence that's embedded in them. So they only have that embedded intelligence once they're in civil 3D. So a little, little background, just so you know, um, this program has been around in one form or another for many, many years. I started using the original version of this back, it was probably 1989. And at that point, it was called um, DCA, which stood for David Charles Arnold, who was the original developer. He was a, a he wasn't, uh, work, didn't work for AutoCAD, but he worked, he programmed civil functions that worked on top of AutoCAD. So that was a, a valuable program for several years. And then what happened was um, there was another company, another software company called DCA at the time. And these guys kept getting each other's mail and that kind of stuff. So DCA decided to change their name to SoftDesk. And um, so it became SoftDesk for many years. And again, they were a very robust, company and they exclusively sold to civil engineers and, and serving uh, type people. But again, this thing worked inside of AutoCAD. So it was always had that AutoCAD link. And eventually AutoCAD bought these guys out. So um, they just bought the company and folded those guys into it and um, remarketed it. So what they developed from SoftDesk was a program called LAN Desktop. And so really there wasn't a whole lot of change between the SoftDesk world and the LAN Desktop world. And that program probably existed for maybe 10 years, eight years, something like that. So they, they really just formatted a new name, Autodesk, after they bought those guys out, they just formatted with a new name, but it was essentially the same product. So it was, um, it was kind of clinky because it was kind of not completely cohesive with AutoCAD. It just kind of worked in and out of it. So there were a lot of things about it that uh, didn't work uh, quite functionally well. And all during this time, Autodesk was developing another program back in the, in the wings there, and it, it was called Civil 3D. So uh, you started when you bought Land Desktop, you started seeing Civil 3D, talk, they started talking about that. And actually when you bought Land Desktop, you also got a copy of this thing called Civil 3D. And the Autodesk kind of said, well, look, you know, we want you people to start using Civil 3D. And they wanted to get people off of Land Desktop because it was a different model type. Okay, the objects in Civil 3D were more robust. Uh, they didn't use as much power. They were easier to manipulate than the ones that were in uh, soft desk or the LAN desktop format. So they developed these um, and then eventually they tried to get people to, to switch over and people weren't. So eventually they said, well, this is the last version of LAN desktop we're gonna have. And then they eventually switched everybody over. So you might actually see some LAN desktop users out there still. Um, I doubt it, but because there's no support for it anymore. But anybody that has the old the old uh, format may have that. So Civil 3D is the new, the newer, the newer platform. Uh, it's completely integrated, and in, uh, it does produce some really wonderful object types that have a lot of intelligence embedded in them. Um, and I'm, I'll show you when you get to points. You can actually still convert old land desktop stuff over into Civil 3D stuff. So there, there are those hooks in there because people do have a lot of drawings that were generated in that format prior to that. So just, uh, I've been using 
in some form or another since 89. But like I said, the civil 3D format came about uh, and then we've been using it ever since. There are some things about it probably that are gonna have to change at some point because AutoCAD is somewhat of a bottleneck. There are certain things about AutoCAD that AutoCAD just can't handle. One is a lot of points. Um, there's a limitation in the number of points that you can have in AutoCAD. And so that, that, and the more points that you have, it can really bog it down. Some of the graphic capabilities are a little bit limited. And also like things like point clouds, any of you guys are doing scanning or heard about scanning, AutoCAD just blows up with a scan. Uh, it doesn't like it at all. So I, eventually, I think they're gonna have to go to some other data format and I'm sure they're working on it. Um, but really since Civil 3D came out, it hasn't changed all that much. In the 10 years, I guess that I've been using it, it really is pretty similar to what it used to be when it started. So I think at some point they'll probably migrate that to a new data model and they will, it probably won't be in AutoCAD at all. But for right now, that's what we're working and a lot of, a lot of engineers are working with it. So you'll see, uh, you'll see other types of softwares out there. Some of you guys might've heard of Carlson is a big one. Carlson's probably the, one of the bigger vendors between uh, Autodesk. They are also Autodesk based inside. They work inside and they're civil, civil software, but they work a lot differently. Uh, they're probably similar to uh, lay a desktop a little bit more, uh, the way they work um, functionally. And they've taken, they've taken the market, they've got a good market share. Uh, they've taken a big bite out of the civil 3D market. They're very, they're very good for surveying stuff. And, that's one thing, civil 3D is probably more civil engineering based than it is surveying. It, it does everything, but um, probably that's why a lot of people have migrated to Carlson. Uh, Carlson is also just right down the road in Maysville, Kentucky. So that's where their corporate headquarters are uh, located. And then another company is MicroStation. MicroStation has a group of, uh, of civil programs that probably are used more by highway designers um, but uh, it's not as it, it, at one time it was pretty big, but I don't see I don't see them having as big market share. So, but anyway, that's just a little aside. Um, so we're going to be utilizing the Civil 3D 2020, and what we want to take a look at today is is talk about um, basically the user interface, and workspace, workspaces, and those kind of things. And I just want to introduce some of this stuff today because Wednesday. I want to, we're going to go out and open some drawings and those kind of things. So we'll get into it. So if you have it kind of at this level, there's a couple different things you can do at this level. You guys, you guys might look different. Uh, one is if you go to open, this would be allowing you to open files or sheet sets or sample drawings that are out there. Um, we might want to, you might want to look at some of those sample drawings because they've got some good stuff in there, but this would just be you know, your normal open. Uh, one thing I will mention when you open up a, a, a drawing in Civil 3D, you usually want that drawing in a Civil 3D format. So if you just take a normal AutoCAD drawing and you open it in Civil 3D, you're not gonna have a lot of the styles embedded in that. So you have to go back and recreate all this stuff unless you import the template stuff into it. Um, so normally my suggestion on that is if you have a drawing that you want to work in in terms of civil 3d probably it's better to open a, a new drawing in civil 3d insert your autocad drawing in as a block and explode it and then it'll have the drawing inside of the civil 3d drawing and you'll have all of your styles available if you do a new which you can do by just clicking this tab up here which we'll do you can also do a new here and then you can grab what are called templates and these are the important things because the template brings all of the styles into the drawing. So there's a, oh, there's thousands of styles associated with, with Civil 3D as we're going to be talking about over the next weeks. And you're going to see how that works. Um, and uh, there's two primary templates that you use, what's called the Imperial and then the Metric. So if you go to Browse Template, you'll notice that they have the Imperial and the Metric. And um, we're going to primarily be using the Imperial Imperial, so make sure that you're using that because that brings in all of the functionality of the Imperial stuff. If you do open up a metric drawing, it's really 
I think it's almost impossible to migrate it over into an Imperial one. Um, but it, if you're clicking on the Civil 3D Imperial, you're getting that template by default. So let's go ahead and um, just, if you've got this up here, you can just click on one of the drawing tabs. So what you've done, you've automatically loaded the Imperial template. So what you're looking at is the uh, graphical user interface of uh, Civil 3D. So now yours may not work, look exactly like mine, um, but uh, it should look similar. And we'll go through all this. And like I said, if there's any questions, stop me as we go through this. Now, a lot of this is AutoCAD, you know, you're recognizing most of this, but then a lot of this is different. So we'll go through, um, we'll go through this and then see if there's any questions. And uh, like I said, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this today because we're going to spend more time on Wednesday going through this. Okay. So is everybody's system up and running? Any questions so far? No, I'm good. Okay. Does it look, does your Shelly look pretty much like mine? Just the front didn't look like yours. It looked like it does in AutoCAD, but the what we're looking at right now, it does. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so there might be things like in my tool space, you may not have all of the setting tabs here. So I'll, I'll show you how some of that we can turn on and off. Um, the one thing too, if you look at my screen, my screen's pretty limited because I'm, uh, I'm working on a laptop for one. So my, my graphics area is a lot smaller than I would like to see. If you're on a bigger, a bigger screen, you get a better picture particularly this guy called your tool space palette. That's really important in Civil 3D and it's, it's important to have it open and it's important to have it sized. Um, but I can change the size a little bit by just clicking on that double arrow like that and limiting a little bit. So if you want more graphical area, which you really do while you're working in Civil, uh, that's pretty important. Okay, so let's start out. We'll just look at this, and again, some of this is very similar to AutoCAD, but over here, uh, the big C here, when you open this up, this is, your, uh, this is your application menu, and it does the same thing as the application menu does in AutoCAD, it just has a big A. Uh, primarily, that's file handling, so new, open, save, save as, um, then you can print, uh, but you got a couple other things that are interesting in there. Um, one is to export and uh, there's some really good file formats. So people are working in different file formats all the time. Um, but you have two that you should be aware of here. Um, so you can um, export your Civil 3D drawing to either an AutoCAD drawing or a MicroStation uh, DGN file format. So what I found is you can do a lot of this with Save As, but uh, Civil 3D doesn't like Save As, so you're better doing an export, okay? Um, DXF is one of those that doesn't work. When you do a save as in Civil 3D as a DXF file, it doesn't work. But if you export it as a DXF file, it works just fine. So um, these two are really kind of important if you're sharing data with other people. Well, like you said, if I said, if you wanted to open it up in AutoCAD, you can export it as an AutoCAD drawing file and it usually works fine. Um, PDF, you guys are familiar with PDF. There's a lot of other file formats. Um, one of the things I've experimented here with lately is exporting this stuff as STL files. And what you can do then is an STL is a stereo lithography file, which you can send to a 3D printer and you can print out your models um, with any normal 3D printer by utilizing that. So I've done some pretty cool stuff where I've generated some some landform stuff and then proposed roadways. And I haven't seen too many other people doing this yet, but it's, it's actually really, really doable and it, it works really well. So this, like I said, this uh, application menu is very similar to the application menu that you've seen many other places. Also, uh, I should mention drawing utilities. Uh, under drawing utilities, there's some good things there, but one of them is audit a file. If you ever have issues with a drawing file, which you might, from time to time in the Civil 3D, you can do what's called an audit on it. And what it'll do is it'll run through, does an internal check on your drawing objects. And if there's an issue with a file, it'll usually delete. So sometimes when you open up a file, you'll get something that says recover. Go ahead and recover it, because what it'll do is it'll audit, and usually it just fixes and deletes stuff that's a problem. 
uh, usually it, it doesn't really hurt your drawing. So that's also a very good thing to know about. You'll see that in AutoCAD occasionally. I don't know if any of you ever run across that recovery thing that'll show up occasionally, but that's what it's that's what it's wanting to do. So what what's a what's a DXF file type? Okay, and that's a good question. Um, DXF uh, came about in in the early days of CAD, back in uh, probably mid to late, well, late 80s, maybe early 90s, um, there was probably 200 different CAD companies out there, right? So, you know, now you got what, AutoCAD and MicroStation, and that's that's about it. There's not that many. So if you had 200 different things, they were all speaking different languages, essentially. So, you know, if I created a drawing in AutoCAD, I couldn't open it up in CAD key. So it, there was just no way to, to get it. So what the, the government and all these CAD companies did is they got together and they said, well, let's write a language that everybody can understand. So what I could do is I could take an AutoCAD file, save it as a DXF, and then I could open that DXF and CAD key, and then it would convert it. So it's, it's like converting it from a common language into another language. So it's like going from French to English and English to Spanish kind of thing, if you will. And, um, it worked very well, but of course, the problem is, is that some objects in say AutoCAD weren't recognized in CAD key. So you'd lose some things in translation, just like you do if you translate anything from one language to another. So it's, it's still pretty important because um, you can still utilize it for that purpose. Um, but you can also sometimes use it to get to a lesser version of CAD. So, if I had, let's say, an, a version of nine of AutoCAD right now, I can't save. I can't save a drawing down to a release nine AutoCAD file, but I could save it as a DXF file, and it'll allow me to open it up. So it still has really good functionality. Um, I use it all the time because my version of AutoCAD, when I save a drawing it puts education across the four edges of my paper. And I, when I, I can't get rid of that when I print it. But the little trick is, is that I can save my file as a DXF file and I can open it up in a little program called uh, TrueView. And TrueView opens up the DXF file and then it deletes the, 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 the educational stuff on it. So that's a kind of cool one. DXF, by the way, they stands for Drawing Interchange File Format. So yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing to know how to use though. And uh, it really does, you, you can save files as DXS, but like I said, in AutoCAD or a civil 3D, what you want to do is export them as a civil. Okay, anything else about that? Okay, um, this area here, this is your quick access toolbar. So most of the stuff here is also in here, open, uh, open, set, uh, new, save, save as, print, undo, redo. So the one thing that's real big in AutoCAD are these things called workspaces. And you may or may not have used those before. Does everybody have their workspace up, shown up here? Anybody not shown the workspace up there? If it's not, you can go over here. This little down tool allows you to customize your quick access toolbar. Um, so anything that has a check in it is up here in the quick access. Anything that's not, you can add to it. So you can add more to that if you want to uh, or turn things off. But workspaces are really important because in Civil 3D, you have different workspaces. So you can think of a workspace as a palette of tools that you're working with. And um, in fact, if you um, have a certain workspace on, you won't even be able to see your Civil 3D tools. So uh, we type a lot. We type a lot of commands in AutoCAD, but you don't type, type a lot in Civil 3D. You're going to grab them via your menus. So right now you have the Civil 3D workspace showing up, which has all these tools on it right now. So if you open up this drop-down list, you'll see there's several other ones. Drafting an annotation, which will take you strictly to a uh, um, AutoCAD form. That's what we were looking at in normal AutoCAD. And then you have what's called 3D modeling. Both of these are pretty much AutoCAD ones. 
And then you have this one called planning and analysis. And this is actually pretty cool because um, that actually takes you to a group of tools that are geographic information system tools, GIS tools. And in fact, you're getting into what's called 3D map. So you actually have another program here called map. I think it's called map 3D. And you can actually download just a separate program of map 3D, but this actually has both of them in it. Um, so for instance, if I, if I go to the drafting and annotation tab, notice what I'm looking at. It just looks like normal AutoCAD, which is really what it is. Civil 3D is still here, but this is just straight AutoCAD. I lost my tool palette and all that stuff. I can go then back to uh, Civil 3D and I'm back in business. So if you just want to do strictly AutoCAD functionality for a while while you're in Civil 3D, um, you can do that. But I want you to keep in mind, you wouldn't want to use Civil 3D as strictly as an AutoCAD project because Civil 3D has a lot of other things that it puts in there, a lot of other objects uh, that as we'll see here in a minute. So let's go to uh, let's go to the planning and analysis workspace. So this brings in a whole lot of other groups of tools, primarily this data section, and this is dealing with um, this is dealing with GIS stuff. So um, you know, he's taken some GIS courses. You'll see there's a there's a lot to that, and um, so this will deal with, work with shape files, um, what geographic information people do. A lot of people in, oh, uh, like the recorder's office, most of the counties, they all use geographic information system stuff. So this is all good. This is all good stuff that you can do. So you can work on this kind of stuff while you're in Civil 3D. So that's kind of the that's kind of the awesome thing about it. So we're going to go back to. Uh, we're going to go back to Civil 3D because that's where we're going to be spending most of our time. So if you do uh, also, what I found, if you lose menus or you screw up your menu because you've customized stuff, which you can do really easily, if you just go to workspaces and you generate one and then you come back to the other, usually it fixes your, usually fixes your menu. Okay. Another place to find the workspaces is down here, that little gear that works down in the, uh, in your status bar. Okay, so that's also an important area. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on if, if nobody has any questions. We're good so far? Okay, so the big thing that you're gonna be working in is the ribbon. <clears throat> the ribbon in Civil 3D uh, is, broken down into tabs, just like we, we normally know that we have the tabs in AutoCAD. The, the majority of what you're gonna be probably doing is working in the Home tab. And the Home tab has these palettes, which are talking about these palettes right here. Okay, so this is your tool space. So if you lose your tool space, like for instance, if I close that, it's kinda of hard to close. I'm gonna close it, okay. That's gonna be kinda of detrimental because everything I wanna do in Civil is right there. Well, you can just generate it real quick back like that, okay? These little buttons up here are these tabs here. So you have what's called the prospector, the settings, the survey, and the toolbox. And we'll come back to those here in a minute. Uh, the next area is create ground data. You notice there's a lot of different things here. Points, surfaces, traversing. Uh, then you also have import data. Okay, we're gonna be working in all these different areas and as we get through this stuff. The majority of what you're gonna see happening is gonna happen in this area where we say the create design panel. And uh, the parcels, feature lines, grading, alignments, profiles, corridors, intersections, assemblies, and pipe networks. So each one of these guys, uh, these are considered objects in, in Civil 3D. So these are object creation, but these, these objects are gonna have completely uh, a great amount of intelligence associated with them. Um, so as we develop these, if you click on your prospector tab, you might notice there's points, point groups, surfaces, alignments, and you kind of see the same thing over here. That's kind of what you're looking at right there, okay. Um, we have this Profile and section views. These are your normal draw commands in AutoCAD. This is the ones you're used to, although there are some that are enhanced. So for instance, if you pick on the line command, 
if you pick on the line command in AutoCAD, it's just got one thing, but notice all of this stuff that's popping out here. Create line by point range, create line by northern easting. Okay, there's a lot of stuff in there. Same thing I think with arcs. Actually, that's just our normal arc command, but there's, there's other tools in there that we're gonna see that we don't have in just normal AutoCAD. And the same thing with your modify commands. These are your normal modify commands. So you'll be used to those. Um, layers, let's take a look at this. AutoCAD Civil 3D works in a huge amount of layers. If you open up your layer command, you'll see there's just a gazillion layers in there. And um, even though you're not using them, these things are all tied to other things within this template. So if you tried to purge them out right now, they won't purge. So you kind of have to deal with this and filtering might be a way if you're not using them. And they follow, they follow the American, I think it's the AIA, the American Institute of Architects uh, format. They developed this a long time ago. So a lot of, a lot of people have bought into that. So when you see the A prefix, that stands for architectural, C stands for civil, and most of the stuff that we use are in the civil ones. So this gets to be, this gets to be really hard to use sometimes. Um, I think V stands for surveying. So anything that you see, those are, those are surveying types of applications. So um, we're gonna be working with those quite a bit, but uh, a lot of the stuff that happens in civil will get job dumped on those layers automatically. And you can change that, but uh, eventually, I just use them starting out. I just use them that way because they're gonna they're gonna be important to to just kind of let it do its thing. Um, so that's your home tab. A lot of a lot of a lot of the stuff we're gonna be doing is gonna happen here, and we're gonna be utilizing a combination of, you know, their create tools, also AutoCAD draw tools, and of course the uh, um, modify tools. Um, then we've got some of the other tabs here. Uh, you're going to see insert. I don't think that's, that's, you know, that's got some differences that you didn't see in say uh, Civil 3D or AutoCAD. So there's a lot of different stuff. By the way, you might see, and you read the book, they'll talk about this thing called InfraWorks. That's a, that's another program out there that does Civil 3D design and it does more, uh, it does more like uh, 3D visualization kind of stuff. And a lot of people are starting to tap into this. And I, I kind of think, I'm not sure about this, but I kind of think this is the next generation of civil 3D. So eventually I think this is where it's gonna go. And this doesn't work inside of AutoCAD. It's a standalone program, which you can, by the way, download. Um, if you're interested in playing with InfraWorks, it's, it's a downloadable free version for you guys. Um, Annotations, we're going to be doing a lot with annotation and they have some wonderful label routines. So, you know, we have the normal dimensioning and multi-leader stuff that we talked about, but then there's a whole group of annotation commands that we'll be looking at. Um, and you got modify and all of these tools, all of these tools are new. They're going to deal with the types of object types that we're talking about, parcels and all of that kind of stuff. Again, we're, we'll see all of this as we get onto it. Analyze has some great tools in it. Uh, for looking at your different as aspects of your drawing. Um, they got like um, rail for railroad design. So if you're a railroad uh, engineer, they've got a lot of good, good tools in that. Um, that's fairly new. Um, used to be Civil 3D did not handle, um, it did not handle railroads very well um, for many, many years actually. And I think about two years ago, they developed this for railroad engineers. Um, and so surveyors, you know, we deal with railroads quite a bit, um, you know, especially surveying around things or something. So this is an, this is a good one to have. Uh, there's an InfraWorks. Here's a whole InfraWorks type of tab that setting that will allow you to like launch that and exchange information between Autodesk, Civil 3D and uh, InfraWorks. Keep your eye on this one. I think that one's going to be one that you're going to see uh, being used eventually in the, in the, in the civil world. So home tab is where we're going to spend most of our time. Okay. So just so you guys are familiar with that. All right. Of course we have the graphics area. Graphics area is the normal graphics area. You're used to that. A couple things. View cube. View cube. You'll be utilizing that a little bit more in this stuff because we, we will be looking at things in three dimensions. 
quite often, especially when we get into surfacing and some of the higher levels. Right off the bat, we're not going to be doing too much with it. Um, now this little tool, these are called transparent tools. Don't lose this guy because this is really important. Um, if you do lose it, I, I forget how to get it back. I'll have to figure that out for you. But it usually is locked or docked over in this corner right here. These are little tools that will interact with your civil 3D objects. So like you can do things like angle distances, you can do point snaps. So some of them are, are kind of like uh, o snaps and some of their other things. So I'm going to show you how to use these, particularly when we get into like points, we get into line work, we get into profiles. This stuff is indispensable. You need this stuff over here. So don't don't blow that one out. Um, okay, down in uh, down here, we have the we have the um, the status bar status bar. You're, you're familiar with model space, paper space, grid on and off snap. Uh, your trackings, you know, your O snaps. You're going to want to be using O snaps a lot. Um, this is a drawing scale for annotation factors, and you don't <clears throat> really need to use that too much while you're working, but it will affect labeling. Um, but it does really shows you what your label looks like at a certain size. So sometimes this is important to set up right off the bat, and sometimes it, we don't we don't worry about it too much. So um, that's uh, one that we'll we'll take a look at that when we get into this a little bit more. Again, here's your workspaces again, if you want that. Um, this is your, uh, this guy is a nice one. This is called Quick Props. This will pop up though if you don't want it sometimes. So I sometimes turn it off when I'm not using it. And if you want to customize this guy down here, you go over to your customization tool and you can see anything that's selected here is showing up down here and anything that you don't want to show up, you can get rid of. Um, so you don't necessarily need all of those if you don't like that. I kind of, again, just kind of let it roll the way it does and then I have it. Okay. So typing is not going to be, you're not going to be typing as many commands in AutoCAD Civil 3D because like I said, you'll be picking them mostly, but I still like if I'm doing a line command, I just type, typically I'll type in a line, hit enter, L, then I'm back in a line, biz, you know, line command. So that's, that's kind of really useful. For me, uh, let's see. If you want to change the size or float your toolbar, remember that your window can float. You can move this guy. Sometimes I think when you open it, it comes up like right there. I usually like it docked down here, and I like to have it no more than about three. But if I want, if you want this bigger or smaller, you can make it smaller. I, I recommend about three to two spaces. If you do more than that, typically it's going to take up again more room. So that's kind of up to you. You can also always open up that window if you want to see it by hitting the F2 key. F2 open. So that's your text screen toggle on and off. Okay, kind of like that. All right, any questions so far? Good. All right. So Let's take a look at this guy. This is your tool space. This is where all of your action happens. Okay. And it's broken down into what we call the prospector. And then we have a settings tab and we have a survey tab. This, you may or may not have the survey tab. If you don't have the survey tab, it's probably because this is turned off up here. So if you turn that on, you get the survey tab. And then you have a toolbox tab. I believe I can change the order in those two, maybe not. Um, toolbox has utilities that allow you to do report generating. So if you're doing like radio stakeout uh, points for people, or you want to list out like all the points in a file or those kind of things, <clears throat> there's some really cool tools once you get into this. So let's take a look at the prospector first. Prospector is going to be a way of when you generate objects in Civil 3D, they're going to show up over here as either a point object or a surface or an alignment or a site or any of those kind of things that you see in there and those are going to allow you to get to those objects very quickly and also you're going to have a lot of right click functionality now i don't have any type of civil 3d object right now so there's nothing showing up but once i do if i launch a drawing that's a civil 3d drawing i'll have information showing up there 
Um, so even this one under alignments, notice if I open that up, you'll notice there's really nothing here. So you just got to kind of recognize that. But once you do have objects in here, you're going to be able to interact with them. And that's really, really, really important. Um, so a lot of our work happens right here. For instance, I can click on that and right click and I can get to things like create or transfer or refresh. Uh, depending on what I do when I right click, notice I get different types of things. Properties, new, I go to surfaces and I right click. I can create a surface, I can do all of this. So we're gonna go step through this, um, but just so you understand, this, this prospector is all important for you. Um, the settings, settings are dealing with settings associated with the drawing um, environment that you're working in. So remember, you're working in a model, and that model um, has all these settings that it's it's utilizing. And all those settings typically are coming from that uh, uh, that template file. Like all of these layers that we saw over here, they're all coming from that template file. Um, so we can set up things here. For instance, if we go to general, you open that up, you'll notice you've got uh, different types of styles. There's label styles, tons of different label styles. Notice if I go to uh, line label styles, I have a bearing and distance and a bearing only, and we're going to be we're going to be utilizing all of these, and or creating or editing them. Um, so these are going to be very important to understand and very important to utilize. Right now, just I just want you to get kind of your feet on the ground with them because uh, they're not going to mean a whole lot yet. Um, so we see that label styles, there's point styles. Notice if we get a points, there's point styles. Everything is a style. And typically it's either driven by the object itself style or for instance, a label style. So there's usually kind of two things that go along with that. What the object looks like, that's its object style, in this case, the point style. And when you label it, how it's gonna label. And you notice when you get labels, there's all these different ones in here. If I click on one of those guys, right click, I can edit it, and it's gonna take me to another thing. So this gets really complex as we start to, to see how this works. So we're gonna, again, we're gonna be stepping through every one of these things as we get into them. So you'll you'll see how this works by the, in a, in a couple of weeks, you're gonna be pretty fluent with all of this stuff, but it, it's just gonna take a while to get your feet on the ground with it, okay? But again, you notice you got, those are point objects, those are surface objects. You have parcel objects, you have grading objects, alignments, profiles, and all of these different things. Okay, so these are settings, and if you're a power user or a company that is doing certain standards that they use all the time, they will go in and set these settings up the way they want them, and then they will create a template file that they use for that company. So instead of using the generic AutoCAD uh, Imperial template, they'll create their own. But you normally use this as a basis. As we get into this process, we're going to just kind of use the, what I call the vanilla version or the out of the box version of AutoCAD's Imper uh, Civil 3D's uh, Imperial template, but we'll be making changes to it. So eventually though, like I said, if you work for a company, or you may work for a company now, they probably have already set a lot of that up. They use it, and it's a way of kind of enforcing everybody to do everything the same way. So I'll kind of be enforcing standards with you as we get drawn into these drawings. Okay, so let's go to the survey tab. So the survey tab has a way of creating what are called survey databases within it. Um, you can create, um, database for the setup, like say you're traversing. Uh, you can also have equipment database. So, you know, if you're using a, a particular total station and you've got a, a offset for your uh, reflector and you've got, you know, centering error stuff and all that kind of things, you can set that up for your database. Fixture uh, figures, figures are basically like lines, are points, well, actually they're lines and curves and polylines that can be set to particular layers with particular colors. But figures become very important when you deal with things like parcels uh, and grading features and those kind of things. 
We'll set up some of those as we get into this. And then you have what are called line work code sets. So if you're out in the field uh, generating data while somebody's shooting like back a curb or center line or center of ditch, it can not only generate a point where they take a shot, but it can also connect line work. And when you insert that from your data collector into your civil 3D drawing, it comes in utilizing these line work codes. So we're gonna we're gonna take a look at some of these as well. You can see they have sample ones in there, and uh, uh, we'll we'll not we're gonna not use this too much, but uh, we'll get you'll get an idea. And then the toolbox, the toolbox has reports. Um, so if you open up this guy, there are ways to like say for instance, if you want to do a point report, um, you can download your points in what's called a CSV format. You can do a point list radial stakeout. There are some things about this that don't work very well. The radial stakeout one doesn't seem to work very well. In fact, I can't even get it to generate on this one, but I found they have another one here under miscellaneous that allows me to do the same thing. I can do a point report here, and this one seems to work. So I think, again, because this program's legacy, it goes way back, there has been some changes in the internet and the way things work, and so um, they've had to change a few things and instead of fixing it, they just generate new things in it. But we'll use, we utilize some of these reports. They're pretty cool uh, for generating things that you wanna see for projects um, that you might wanna get to a, a client, let's say. If you wanted a, a complete listing of all their points, you could do it through a point reporting like this. Okay, so the prospector, prospector is probably the most important area. Settings will be kind of the most, second most. and then. We won't use survey too much, but toolbox we use a little bit as well. But again, this is this is going to be the area we're going to use a lot. And as we start to see objects show up in here, which Wednesday I'm going to bring some files in for you to open, and we're going to look at these. You're going to see how these work, see how these objects uh, um, show up. Okay, any questions? Okay, one other um, thing here in the prospector is if you go up to the prospector in the drawing and you right click, oh, that's not the one I want to do. Go to settings, sorry. Settings, go up to the drawing name and right click. You've got edit your drawing settings, edit label style defaults, um, land XML and table tag numbering. Uh, let me mention this, land XML, uh, that's another type of transferability that you can utilize for different CAD vendors. Um, so it's kind of like the DXF we just talked about before, um, but it's it's primarily for civil people. So one of the things that um, you'll find that if you are working, let's say in Carlson, you can create a surface in Civil 3D, which is a topographic surface, but if you open up that file in Carlson, it won't recognize your surface. It'll just think it's polylines or something. If you export your surface in a land XML format, you can then open that in Carlson from the land XML and you'll get your surface. So it's a way of transferring civil objects, not just lines, polylines, arcs, and that kind of stuff. That's a pretty cool tool. And then land XML has been uh, around, I don't know, maybe 10 years. So again, it's primarily for civil engineering and surveying type people that are transferring data between, let's say, Mike MicroStation, Carlson, you know, and these types of programs. Okay, so that's that's a good tool. But what I wanted to get to here was the drawing settings. So, so again, I'm on the settings tab. Right click on your drawing name, and let's go to edit drawing settings. So this box is pretty important when you set up your general settings on your uh, on your drawing. So it kind of steps across, you have what are called units and time zones, transformations, layering, abbreviations, and ambient settings. So this is a way you can set up some of that stuff within it. Um, usually units, we're not gonna change that, but one thing to be aware of, um, right now you're drawing um, units in feet and angular units degrees. Um, if you're drawing it in feet, you know, you got two settings and depending on the state you're in, you're either international feet or U.S. survey feet. I mean, technically we should probably be working in U.S. survey feet. 
Uh, for a small drawing, there's not going to be a lot of difference between the two. But in a larger drawing scale, that'll, that'll make a difference. Um, as far as this, this is really not um, important in terms of your overall drawing because that's just having to do with labeling. And this command right here, that scale setting and this are the same down here. So you can change that after the fact. Um, transformation has to do if you're dealing with like say state plane stuff. So you got a state plane coordinate system that you're working in. Let's say you're working in Ohio South. You can set <laughs> your drawing up to the Ohio South. It's got, it grabs all the projections. And as you bring the data in, it can project it down to state plane or back up to ground. Um, object layers. This is a way you can set things so that it'll dump certain things on different layering for you. So notice um, we have road layers. Um, when they remember the C is the civil civil road. So your alignments go on that. You can change that in here. So if I want to change that to a different layer, I can do that. Change the color. Change all the properties. And I can lock that so it's always going to stay on that level layer if I want to. Abbreviations, these have to do with general labeling. So when you label certain things, it's automatically going to call this stuff. And if you don't like that, you can change that. Um, again, we're going to pretty much roll with what we have here for now. Ambient settings, there's some important ones here, and I'll explain that. But notice these are like things like united things. So, you know, degree of curve. Uh, distances. So like for instance, if we go to distance, it's showing you what distance unit it's working in. So remember it's you, it's work right now working in international feet. Um, and uh, the precision is set to two. Um, so one thing you guys should know that there's a units command in AutoCAD, but you don't want to use the units command in AutoCAD. You want to use the units essentially through the ambient settings here. So um, again, this is just also displayed precision, not ultimate precision. So for instance, notice uh, your distance here is, is two decimal place accuracy or precision. But if you go to coordinate, I can set that to a different value. One of the ones that's really, really important is this one called angle. An angle is normally set to a decimal degree format. So usually we don't want to do that. So one of the things I'm going to have you do routinely is if you're doing anything angle based, you're going to want to set this to a DMS like that. So we'll, um, we'll take a look at this later on, make sure that uh, you guys are all good with this stuff. Okay. Anybody uh, have any questions so far? Okay. So, one more thing and then I think I'm gonna stop for the day. And what I want you to do is we'll go ahead and have you read this section. But Wednesday we're gonna pick up, we're gonna see how this works and then next week we'll just start to jump into stuff. So let's look at uh, paper space. So keep in mind your, your model, your model is completely uh, gonna be in model space and all your, all your major action is gonna happen there. Um, however, as you get into these other processes, uh, you're going to want to make sure that um, you know how to use paper space, which we spent a lot of time doing that. So keep in mind too, um, we always say that we draw full scale in AutoCAD and that's true. But one of the things that's going to be realistically to the civil 3D is that you're really drawing full scale to what you're using. So we're saying that one unit is one foot but in actuality, it's one inch. So you're actually using a decimal unit in AutoCAD setup. And so we say 600 feet, we're actually 600 inches. So that makes a difference when you plot things. Um, although the way Civil 3D handles it, it talks to you as if you're like saying one inch is equal to 40 feet, but you're actually one inch is equal to 40 units. So it's really says one inch is equal to 40, but it's really one to 40 instead of one to 40 feet. So if we go to a layout, layout is gonna look a little bit different than what we saw or experienced in uh, the layout modes. It does have some cool tools in here, which we'll be looking at. Um, one of the things is that it brings up this context sensitive tab here and you have either the layout tab, which you can go to, or you got the layout tools. And some of the nice things are you can bring in our reference map, displayed map, or you can bring in uh, a legend. North arrow, they have a lot of different north arrows. 
and I'm going to show you this one. Okay, there they go. Some of them are really junk, I think, but there's a couple of them that I like. One being, I use this one all the time. And then you have a scale bar. And again, these are not, these are going to reference your scale. And I'll show you guys this on Wednesday, but what's kind of neat about this is when we float in our title block and we open up a viewport, the view error, the north error and the scale bar will be referenced to one of those viewports. And um, if the viewport scale factor changes, the scale bar will update for you. And the north error will determine whether north is up in the viewport or not. So if you want to rotate, let's say the north arrow going this way, if you rotate the north arrow, the picture is going to rotate with it. So that's actually pretty cool because if you do that in just normal AutoCAD, you have to use a different command to do that. So paper space works very, very well in, in Civil 3D. But just keep in mind is like when we're plotting paper space and we say one inch is equal to 60 feet. So for instance, if I go here and I say plot it, you'll notice they have custom settings, one inch is equal to 60 feet. It's actually not one inch is equal to 60 feet. It's one unit is to 60 units. Right? But we'll be handling that all through our, uh, through our viewports anyway. So everything we're gonna be plotting is one to one, okay? All right, so um, take a look, you know, get your book. Um, if you wanna read that section, page uh, 1-2 to 1-20. They do a pretty good job of going through all of these things. Um, keep in mind, it's, it, it's very overwhelming at first. Uh, once we start to get into these tools, they all have like multiple, multiple things going on here. And um, so, but we're going to be stepping through them and working on those and uh, making sure that we've got everything that we need. So if anybody has any questions, I'll hang out. Otherwise, I'm going to stop the recording and... Um, then you guys can uh, get get set for the day, and and on Wednesday, on Wednesday.